Hello everyone, Charles Watts here, the Arsenal correspondent at Goal. Um, just thought I'd pop on record another one of these videos, really. So much to talk about after yesterday's game at Brighton. Sorry to drag it all up again. I'm sure plenty, plenty of you want to forget about what happened at the Amex, but you know, there's so much to talk about, so much fallout, so much opinion um, shared since then. I thought I'd just pop on, just, just sort of discuss the video, uh, just sort of discuss the game, discuss what happened and um, you know, see what you guys got to say in the comments. And because um, it was such a it was such a bad afternoon for Arsenal in the end, wasn't it? I mean, it was it was strange. Let me just talk about the game first of all, and then we'll talk about what, what's happened since. But the game itself, I actually I don't know if I'm on my own on this because judging by a lot of the comments I've been getting on social media, talking to people about the game, I am. But I actually don't think Arsenal played too badly. I thought it was an all right performance. It was a game they should have won comfortably. They created more than enough chances to win it comfortably. Unfortunately, they came up against a goalkeeper who was in very good form. They were unlucky in a few chances with. Uh, Saka hit the bar obviously in the first half um, Ryan saved really well from Lacazette in the first half Lacazette had a shot blocked in the set in the first and then the second half as well was you know Bamiang goes through as a goal that was ruled out from VAR correctly but you know it's just margins um, had another couple of shots saved by um, Ryan in the second half obviously got the goal from Pepe and you know if Arsenal got on and won that game I think everyone looked at him and thought it was an all right put away performance from Arsenal kept Brighton who were pretty poor at arm's length for most of the game and it were comfortably I thought the better side and the side that were looking to win it they created all the chances and then that just that last 15 minutes it just was a disaster I don't I didn't did not see it coming it was like they went into their shell once Pepe had scored the goal great goal for Pepe really good for him as well to score a goal like that and um then they just disappeared into their shell it was like the old Arsenal and it was just a real shame that they managed to find a way of losing a game that they absolutely should have won and should have won comfortably. And I suppose that says a lot about the makeup of this Arsenal team, the character of this Arsenal team. It says a lot about the defence as well because it was awful defending for the first goal from the corner. Totally switched off from the short corner. Second goal was a very good goal, I thought. Rob Holding maybe caught a little bit slow from the flick towards Morpy when he made the run, but I thought it was a really well-worked goal from Brighton. But the first goal especially, just not good enough. Um, defending, they just switched off and got punished. You could tell Mikel Arteta after the game was really, really angry over it. Um, so it was, it was a strange afternoon, I thought. I mean, it was just the whole atmosphere of it. I'm not sure if you've seen my video that I posted before from yesterday on just the sort of what it was like behind behind the scenes. It was a really strange atmosphere, just in a dead quiet stadium, very few people around. And um, I can imagine for the players, it's really it's a really difficult experience to sort of get their head around as well. Um, and just to end it the way they did, it was just such a it was such a shame. And it, I think, it, like I said, it says a lot about the character of this Arsenal team and the makeup of this Arsenal team that they just haven't got it mentally to see games through. And I think that's what we see time and time again because yeah, this was a game, and that's why Mikel Arteta was so angry, and you could tell he was fuming after. Um, was because of just how he knew his side had thrown away three points. You know, guaranteed three points. It would have moved them. You know, we've been touching distance to the likes of Manchester United, but now you're looking at it, you think Champions League, you know, that is done now. The, and Europe, Europa League as well. You sort of look at the Wolves game, Wolves played West Ham afterwards, and you, and you compare the two, and Wolves are just so much better place than Arsenal. They've got so many, they're so organised, brilliant on the counter attack. Um, and yeah, I just think it's going to be a really tough job now for Arsenal even to get in Europa League. It's been a disastrous week. You think all the optimism we had coming back for Project Restart been sucked out of us in the space of a few days with two defeats injury after injury after injury um and yeah it's, it's really and I, feel, I do feel sorry for Arteta I know he's getting some grief and from some quarters on social media and he does deserve some of it because some of his decisions I think have been perhaps odd and I'll get onto that later but I think he's inherited such a mess at the club and this and the shutdowns well came at a time when he was really beginning to build momentum and then it was all stopped and the delay in the season as well was really um, not helped in the slightest when, with some of the big issues that surround the club, say Saka's contract, Bamyang's contract, what he was planning for the summer. And it's just the mood around the place all of a sudden, because it felt really good before the restart, but the, just these two defeats and everything has just sucked the life out of everyone and put a spotlight on the club again, which um, just feels, it just feels like we're back at square one. You've got the Ozil situation as well. Obviously, I know he was back in the squad yesterday, but it all just suddenly feels like we've taken a big step back, whereas before the shutdown, it felt like we'd just taken a big step forward. Um, they just need to win. They just need to get a couple of wins. They've got Southampton on Thursday, obviously, and then they've got the Cup game, which is now massive at uh, um, Sheffield United at the weekend. 
they've got to get a win uh, and well, a couple of wins from those games and just give themselves something to cling on to over the final few weeks of this season. Obviously, the major talking point from yesterday's game was Bernd Leno. Now, he's been assessed today. He's seen specialists today. He's, seen, he's having all the scans taken today. Uh, the knee's obviously in a really bad shape and they need to wait for swelling to go down and um, and everything. But Arsenal are hoping in the next 48 hours they'll know for sure the extent of the damage. But the fears are he's done his, he's ruptured the possibly ruptured the cruciate ligament in his left knee. If that is the case, then you're looking at possibly a year out for Bernd Leno, which is an absolute disaster for Arsenal. It's heartbreaking for Leno. He's playing so, so well. You know, tossed up between him and Aubameyang for player of the season. Um, even yesterday made a couple of good saves Leno before the injury. Um, and it's just such a shame. It's, such, it's bad luck on Arsenal. So this is going to be, in the space of 18 months, if it is confirmed as a cruciate ligament, they've got to have lost Holding, Bellerin, Chambers and Leno to cruciate ligament injuries in the space of 18 months. I mean, that is just unprecedented um, and on top of that obviously it's come just in the same week that Jack has got injured Pablo Mari has got injured for a significant amount of time um, and then you've still got injuries to Cedric Suarez Socrates I mean Arsenal go to Southampton on Thursday they're going to be without eight senior players seven injured at least eight injured senior players seven injured and then Louise suspended um, which is what I'm saying about how much of a disaster the start of this restart has been for Arsenal my view on the Leno incident I think Neil Morpey was really really sly I think it was a totally avoidable injury I can understand why Leno was so angry because there's no way he should have been out for a year from this more people was never getting the ball never ever going to get the ball he knew it as well it was just one of those little shoves you see it all the time I know for me that doesn't excuse it because this was a needless injury absolutely unnecessary didn't need to happen more people just let him claim the ball which he was going to claim the ball more people knew it Leno knew it everyone in the stadium knew it everyone watching on TV knew it and yet just that little shove, yes, it was only little, but it's had massive consequences. And I think he's bang out of order. And I also thought it was bang out of order for his comments. He was talking about Arsenal players need to show some humility. I think knowing for well what he'd done during that game, I think he needed to show a little bit of humility as well and not rub Arsenal players' noses in it after the game. Yes, he'd scored the winner, but I think he knew he knows deep down what he did. He knew that it was an unavoidable injury. So I think he needs to he needs to wash watch his mouth a little bit rather than going and spouting off after the game. Um, without Arsenal players. Now, Guendouzi, we're looking at possibly facing a ban. So although I say it might be eight missing at Southampton, that's why I said at least eight, because Guendouzi, we saw what happened after the game. We saw the reaction with Morpey, grabbed him around the throat. I'd be surprised if he escapes a ban for that, Matteo Guendouzi. I'm pretty sure the FA are going to take a look at it, and I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up getting at least a one-match ban for, uh, for the incident. Now, Guendouzi, again, has been coming in for a lot of grief Today, you know, he did lose his head and he has got this attitude, which we all know about, that he needs to control. I remember doing an interview with Jeremy Aliadier, the former Arsenal player, who came through, well, um, Guendouzi was coming through at Lorient when Aliadier was there. And, you know, they're, they're close mates. And even Aliadier says, Matteo needs to calm down. He needs to grow up as a human um, as well as a footballer and it's just he does he needs to control himself and I do want wonder you know I know the type of man Mikel Arteta is and I do wonder if Guendouzi is really putting his Arsenal career in jeopardy um, with the way he behaves sometimes and the way he loses his head and he can't seem to control his emotions now a lot of people I know won't wouldn't don't think it would be a bad thing if Matteo Guendouzi sold I, I'm on the fence with it I don't I I think he's, he's some player with some talent. You've got to think how quickly he's progressed in such a short pace, space of time, Matteo Guendouzi. He's clearly a real talent. But I do think, given what I've seen from him so far and the lack of awareness I seem to be seeing from him in certain situations and the fact he's not learning from it, I do wonder if a decent bid came in for him in the summer. Maybe Arsenal would be wiser to, to take it and invest it elsewhere, um, try and invest it elsewhere. But I, I think plenty of... I think that about most of the players. I think everyone in this squad is for sale. Bar Bernd Leno, um, I'd probably say, and Martinelli, and I'm going to talk about Martinelli in a minute. Um, you know, everyone everyone's for sale because they're not, they're not good enough, frankly. I know Aubameyang's fantastic in terms of goal scoring, but we know what his contract situation is. So I just don't think there's very many people that, aren't, that are unsellable in our Arsenal squad. And again, that says a lot about where Arsenal are for me because they're just not good enough. And I think they are where they are in the league 
because of the results. And that's why I think Mikel Arteta, he's got a huge job on his hand and it is just made even harder by everything that has gone on since he's arrived at the club with the pandemic, with the financial issues that he's going to have to face. All the plans about rebuilding in the summer and what he would have wanted to do in the summer have taken a massive hit. And now on top of that, with the little, little amount of money they're going to have to play with, really, compared to others, some of their rivals, they've now got a situation where they're having a, going to have to consider signing a goalkeeper, spending whatever budget they've got, spending some of it on a goalkeeper, which is one position they were never even imagining having to spend money on. And even if it's a, they just bring in a loan as a possible cover for a year, because I wouldn't be surprised they give Emmy, let Emmy Martinez be number one for the year, because I think Emmy's a fine goalkeeper and... Um, I don't think he's going to let anyone down, but if they do promote Emmy to be the full number one next season while Leno's recovering, then they're going to have to bring in a backup because I'm not sure Matt Macy's ready to be number two for the whole season. Um, then even if you just do it on a loan deal, a sort of season-long loan, they're still going to have to pay a loan fee, they're going to have to pay wages, all that is money. And when money's as tight as it is at Arsenal right now, it's a real blow and it's a real blow to Arteta's transfer plans, I think. And then you've also factored Mary into that, a player that Arteta wants to sign permanently. Arsenal have got an option to sign it permanently. Flamengo have said that Arsenal, that transfer is already guaranteed. Now, sources are telling me that that is not the case. Certainly people I know at Arsenal are saying they haven't guaranteed that they are definitely going to sign Mary and all they have is an option. And the idea was they were going to. Now, Arteta says he wants them to sign permanently, even despite the injury. But then again, if he's injured for a... Even if it's just the first couple of months of next season, then you're looking at spending money again that you don't really have on a player you're not going to be used for a couple of months. So it's just the last week has been horrendous. I don't know what Arteta has done to deserve this bad slice of luck. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's very, very unfortunate. Now, as I was saying earlier, I know Arteta's getting some grief and I, I'm kind of defending him here a little bit because I still think he's doing, he's doing a good job in the circumstances. One thing I don't quite understand is the whole Martinelli thing. He's made an awful lot of substitutes in the last two games since the restart. I mean, he made, what, five yesterday, I think. He probably, I think he made the same against Manchester City, a couple of which were enforced. But we've not seen Gabriel Martinelli yet, and I just don't really understand the thinking about that. You know, we're seeing Eddie and Kessier every single time, and Eddie and Kerry was starting before the lockdown, uh, ahead of Alexander de Lacazette, and Martinelli is just kicking his heels, doing very, very little. And he scored 10 goals this season, you know, even in the early stages under Arteta, when um, Aubameyang was suspended after his red card at... Palace, Martinelli got his chance, he scored that goal against Chelsea, he scored at home as well, um, he scored two goals in the three games when he was playing in place of Aubameyang and, and yet now he's just not, he's not getting a look in which is, which is quite bizarre, it's certainly one of the things on the agenda this week, we're speaking to Mikel Arteta probably on Tuesday, maybe on Wednesday ahead of the Southampton game and what's going on with Martinelli will be bang on the agenda of that press conference, there'll certainly be questions on it because um it's, it's an intriguing one for me. I, I, I just want to know what Arteta's thinking about Martinelli, why he's not playing him at the moment. Is there a real reason for that? Where he sees him sort of fitting in in a team where he thinks his best position? Because I always find it interesting when Arteta talks about his two strikers, when he's talking about the competition between Nketiah and Lacazette, he always says two strikers, but you know I've got two strikers competing for places. But really he's got three because Martinelli's shown that he can be a central striker. He can score goals. He has scored goals. He's Arsenal's he's scored ten goals this season. I'm not even sure if Lacquer's got more than that. I haven't I haven't checked. But um you know it's just it's a strange one for me. I think he's been so so good, Martinelli. One of the rare bright spots in Arsenal season and the lack of game time recently has really surprised me. So that'll be bang on the agenda um this week ahead of that game against Southampton. Like I said, we will be sitting down doing our Zoom press conference with Mikel Arteta. Um uh, in the next couple of days and we might get an update whether on Bert Leno whether that will happen whether the club will deliver the update once the um, test results have come back or they'll wait for the Mikel Arteta press conference I imagine they'll probably put something out in the next couple of days we spoke to someone earlier um, at Arsenal and they they were sort of putting a 48 hour mark on when we might know more about the significant or the impact of Leno's injury and how long he might be sidelined for but the fears of the club certainly are that he's looking at a, a really significant amount of time on the uh, on the sidelines. And those dreaded words, cruciate ligament injury, are um, the ones that everyone is fearing right now. But we'll have to have to wait and see on that. That Southampton game is going to be intriguing. I mean, they they played very well, got a good win at Norwich um, on the Friday night, wasn't it? And um, 
you know, they're a very intense team, Southampton. We've seen that um, under Hassan Hurtle, and it's going to be a really difficult one for Arsenal. They're going to have to pick themselves up. They're going to have to raise themselves off the floor, and I know they were on the floor after that late, late defeat on Saturday. Um, so they're going to have to really pick themselves up because they need to get some wins here. It's a really important... I mean, I know that there's almost nothing to play for now because, for me, they're not going to get Champions League. I don't think they're going to get Europa League. I think they can put all their eggs in the FA Cup basket because they've got something to play for there. But in terms of the league, you almost, you, it's all about progress for me now between now and the end of the season and trying to get some sort of momentum before the summer. But you kind of look at Bamiyang yesterday and look at how he was on the final whistle and you think, God, these, these, these defeats and these bad, bad moments are not going to help convince him to stay and sign that new contract. And that's another reason why I think these last few weeks are really important because if they are going to convince Orba to stay, he needs to see building box blocks for the future. And at the moment, I think it's a struggle for him or anyone to see that given what's going on at the moment. I think before the lockdown, there were the building blocks. You, you were seeing signs of improvement under Arteta. There was some momentum building. They've got to somehow get back to that and they've got to pick themselves up from these defeats and really start to fit, try and finish the season as strongly as possible. Whether Arteta will now use it as a um, opportunity to blood some even more of his younger players because he's doing it a lot at the moment. We saw it. I mean, that triple substitution at the end last night has caused a lot of controversy. Really, but taking off Pepe, Saka, and was it Sabios and bringing on Nelson, um, Tierney, and I can't remember who the final one was. But it caused, it caused a lot of controversy, especially Versal sitting on the bench, didn't get a look in um, again yesterday, even though he was back. So, you know, lots of questions for Arteta, but I do think you've got. A, You've got to um, sort of add everything up and realise just how difficult it is for him at the moment. Maybe he's not helping himself sometimes with some of the substitutions he's making, but I do think he's he's got his hands massively tied behind his back at the moment because of this absolute mess the club was left in, the state of the squad, the, the question marks over the futures of so many of the squad. Um, so it's just all adding up to a really, really difficult job for... Mikel Arteta and he needs to get wins and uh, hopefully that will start on Thursday night. Like I said, we've got press conference coming up and I will um, on uh, Tuesday or Wednesday and I will be trying to keep you updated with videos and head over obviously to goal.com. Head over there now if you haven't. And um, you see my, I've done a piece this morning, sort of follow up from yesterday, talking about the transfer issues really that have come out of the last week or so for Arsenal, talking about the Leno injury, the Mary injury and how that might affect the tra transfer plans for for Mikel Arteta going forward. So please do head over to goal.com and um, or head over to my Twitter, which is at Charles underscore Watts, and uh, you'll see the post, the links to the stories that I have done in the last couple of days. Right, thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. If you haven't subscribed, please do hit the subscribe button down there. And um, thank you for your support, as always, with the videos, and have a good rest of the weekend and stay safe.